I mean, I guess it's a little bit um, uh, spilt milk at this point uh, to ask whether they should have um, uh, even even attended those hearings, frankly. Uh, I, I mean, a ret- I mean, I, I certainly at the time thought they should have boycotted. It's very hard to make the argument that this is a sham, but let me participate, because as soon as they do, it's, it seems like every other hearing that has ever happened. And in fact, by the end, it turned out to be one that was, you know, all about Senate comedy. Um, but what do you think? Uh, and, uh, you know, I know you may probably still have some friends in the office, but do you think that Chuck Schumer is doing enough to slow the process? And simultaneously, what do you think about the theory that if um, there is a, a cohort of, of Democrats, it may be generational, that are looking to reform the Supreme Court, whether that involves term limits, whether it involves uh, expanding its size, they would have a better basis in which to do it if the vote on Amy Coney Barrett had to take place after the election when everybody was in lame duck. So first of all, I don't think it's, um, you know, crying over spilt milk to say that I, I do think they should have boycotted the hearings. We said that at the time, you know, the, the, the senators and this part is not generational. This, this was, this was a fairly common sentiment that we encountered as we were trying to propose to them that they boycott the hearings. Um, um, even the, even some of the junior members of the committee that are usually pretty good, um, all thought that there were more points to be scored by uh, confronting her with her record, asking her questions. And, you know, these Supreme Court hearings are a joke in general. Like, the, 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 by the time they get elevated to the Supreme Court, these nominees are very practiced in the art of studiously avoiding answering any questions. It's, and to be frank, you know, this, the, the intellectual caliber of some of these people that get nominated for the court, um, they're better at evading questions than the senators are at asking them. So I was one of the people that thought that there was, it, her record was very damning as it was before going into the hearing. There were very, very little upside to be had by participating in a sham process. And I thought that the air of legitimacy would have completely been taken away if the Democrats just decided in mass that we're not gonna participate in the hearings. You've actually seen in some polling since the hearings concluded, that support for among rank and file uh, registered Democrats for her nomination is up yeah. because I think most people that are only paying casual attention to this, when all the sort of formalities of the process are being carried out, it, she, it confers an air of legitimacy on her. And I think that it would have, uh, it would have gone over uh, far differently if the Democrats just removed themselves from the process in the way that the Republicans did when they decided that they weren't going to consider the Merrick Garland nomination. I agree. I, mean, I, think I think look to how they handled it four years ago to see what we should have, what playbook we could have carried out this time. It's a classic case of 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 show don't tell. If you're if you're all standing outside the committee uh, hearing, you, nobody has to listen to the words you're saying. They just know that you're not going in there for some reason, and there's a problem. Uh, but so. so do you think that there is that that Chuck Schumer has um, arrows in his quiver uh, that he is willing to use or is he deployed any of those at this point to maybe push the vote? If you and, and I'd like your your response too to that theory that, you know, doing this in the lame duck increases the outrage uh, that could lead to maybe, um, you know, uh, incentivizing some reform later. Do you think? Yeah, I, I, from the beginning, we have said um, uh, internally and to other allied organizations and to Senate offices that, like, uh, look, we know that um, <clears throat> they have the votes, but let's just set a, a goal for ourselves in the short term of seeing if we can get this past the election, because depending on the results of the election, it may completely change the complexion of this whole thing and their willingness to go forward if they've just lost the, the, the 2020 elections might change their outlook. Um, I think that Schumer, Schumer is, you know, uh, handled this, I, th- I think, in, a, in, a, in an interesting fashion. Schumer personally has actually been quite good, I think. Uh, his outreach has been pretty constant to progressive groups. You know, a lot of the big progressive movement organizations have big centers of gravity in New York City. And so if you look at organizations like Center for Popular Democracy, if you look at Indivisible, um, if you look at Working Families Party, a lot of them are sort of um, centered in New York City. And over the last four years, a lot of their affiliates for those organizations have spent a lot of time protesting outside Chuck Schumer's Park Slope apartment in Brooklyn. Um, And he has taken notice of those groups. 
I think he's doing weekly calls with all those organizations on a personal basis himself it, throughout uh, this whole five weeks now since RBG passed away. So his, he, you know, he's in cycle in 2022. He has seen, uh, he has seen Elliot Engel lose his seat. He's seen Crowley lose his seat. And I don't think Schumer is in danger of losing statewide um, in a primary challenge in 2022, but I think he is well aware of the optics of how weak it would make him look if he had a formidable challenger from the left that a lot of these organizations got behind. And so I think being the good politician he is, he is trying to be responsive to those organizations, especially the ones that have a center of gravity in his home state. And so one of the consistent refrains from the from our coalition, including those groups that I mentioned, has been use every tool in your disposal in the Senate. I think that they are making an honest effort on, on that. They have done things like invoke the two hour rule that shuts down hearings during days when the Senate's in session. Um, they've had motions to adjourn um, that have failed because McConnell's had the votes. Um, they're doing quorum calls, there's supposed to be one today that requires the Senate to scramble all their members to get, uh, so that all the Republicans are on the floor if they wanna proceed with Senate business. Um, they, they did craftily pull off a maneuver where McConnell was sort of caught sleeping and Chuck filed cloture on a bill, which is very rare for anybody other than the majority leader to do, which sucked up two and a half days voting on an ACA related measure and put all the Republicans on the record about the ACA lawsuit that Trump's bringing. They've said publicly that they will boycott the markup hearing on Thursday and force the Republicans to either provide a quorum themselves to advance that nomination or change the rules of the committee in order to do so. So um, there's some things that people have asked that they've um, that so far they haven't done, like um, like there was a letter sent yesterday signed by 20 different groups asking Pelosi to send an impeachment resolution on Bill Barr over to the Senate, which would force McConnell to have to consider it. Um, but that's something that would have to originate in the House and the Senate procedural experts tell us that at most, you know, McConnell would probably only spend one legislative day on that. Um, but if you look at other, if you look at other sort of like what has been like litmus test moments in terms of testing the resolve of the Democrats, uh, one of the other things that we asked of the Democrats was don't take courtesy meetings. One of the usual traditions is that after a nominee is named, they go up to the Hill and they do um, courtesy meetings where, you know, for 45 minutes to an hour, they talk about their views. And it's a charade where photo ops happen. And that also confers an air of legitimacy. Seven of the 10 Democrats on the committee took meetings with the nominee, which made me want to pull my hair out. Schumer um, said he wouldn't meet with uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and he's held to that. Um, and then when it comes to the idea of adding seats, Schumer's answer has been probably the best um, of anyone in the caucus other than Ed Markey. Ed Markey has actually come out and said that he's for adding seats if the Republicans go through this. Schumer has said everything's on the table. Um, uh, and so on most of the questions, I think Schumer in his personal capacity has been quite good. The, the, where the frustrations come in is that um, I think people sometimes hope that Schumer as leader will sort of drag the caucus along so that it's, you know, not just Chuck refusing to meet with the nominee, but Chuck telling the other 46 Democrats to also boycott those meetings. Schumer is not that kind. He doesn't view the majority, the minority leader position in that way in terms of he's, he's, he's frequently will tell outside groups that uh, lobby him that, he can control what he does. He can make recommendations to the rest of the caucus, but he can't dictate terms to the rest of the caucus. And so I think that there's still some frustration in some corners of the progressive movement because a lot of them wish he would be a little bit more heavy handed, like um, but really that's not how he approaches the job. He would lead a little more. I mean, he's looking at the entire Senate caucus, it seems to me, like the Baileys. Uh, his uh, famed family from Long Island. And as long as he provides services for them, he thinks he's doing their job. Uh, he's doing his job. But as leader, he's supposed to be basically, you know, whipping uh, people and leading a strategy as opposed to providing, you know, constituent services uh, for the other senators. And I think that's, you know, as far as I can tell, that's the that's the issue. I mean, I, I, you know, I think he's He's doing a good job of making sure that he re remains uh, Senate um, minority leader and maybe majority leader and also a senator from New York. But that's not necessarily sometimes you have to expend some of that capital to be a leader, it seems. And if we needed it, it would it would be now.